Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Hell Bent, chapters 21 through 25. In these chapters, it turns out that guy was a vampire, which you would have heard me realize in the last episode. But it turns out also that uh, this isn't really talked about anywhere in the records. So is Alex one of the only people who knows these are real? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Joanna for commissioning this episode. What's up, Joanna, if you're out there? Um, so yeah, this this revelation, it doesn't seem like uh, anybody is quite aware vampires are a real thing when Alex goes looking for some information later. And I am really, really curious if that is because it's a closely guarded secret that wouldn't be in just any uh, records or if it's because they genuinely don't know about it. I mean, I don't really know why to be a super closely guarded secret. I don't know, but I'm really, really wanting to know a lot more about this. So we start off 21 in the midst of the fight, which I read some of the, excuse me. Oh my God. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm suffering from this weird thing with allergies and the hiccups. Oh, it's a mess. Oh. <laughs> Did you hear that? Did it again. Oh my God. Forgive me. But I read part of this at the end of the last episode. And this is really a scary moment because Alex is so blindsided by it. Um, she manages to pull in the gray that's outside the gates, which the gray later tells her none of us like go there because that's where he buries everybody. And as soon as the gray is inside her, the vamp pulls back and says, you taste like the grave. It's wild because it's like that moment. It's clearly just the gray's presence changes everything. And I find that kind of fascinating. So she gets in a couple of hits and then he literally is flying in the air in front of her and says a real puzzle. Now I understand why Etan Harrell sent an emaciated child after me, but what exactly are you honey lamb? And this is the like pet name. I hate, I hate, don't like calling it that because it's for me, when you say pet name, it implies consent between the individuals that you be called this. And that's clearly not happening, but this is what Darlington calls her later. Um, and she is thinking about the only way to kind of get at this guy. And the one time she got a reaction out of him was when she threatened to destroy some of his shit. So she takes a figurine, throws it through some doors and isn't sure if he took the bait and chased after it to catch it. She just goes into the bar, smashes a bunch of bottles and then throws a match. And, uh, it looks like it went out. And for a second, she's going to start crying. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, and everything goes up. The vampire howled. Alex dove behind the flames, using them for cover, feeling the heat grow and trying to cover her mouth as smoke billowed up. She stripped off her hoodie and wound it into a makeshift torch, soaking it in liquor, fire gathering around it like a ball of cotton candy. She bolted for the French doors and tossed the torch behind her, heard a whoosh as the curtains caught. And unfortunately, that hoodie had the keys to the car in it. I am hoping that those keys have melted beyond recognition. But there is a part of me that's worried 
he is going to take the keys and somehow use the car to find her. We'll get to this. Um, so she busts through the gates. She gets to the car, realizes that she doesn't have the keys and she's trying to figure out what the fuck she can do. She's not sure how much he can track her, whether he would bother. Um, and she could feel the gray begging her to stop. Ahead, she saw a highway exit and a gas station. She slowed her steps, but didn't stop until she'd entered that bright dome of fluorescence. And she is like right in front of it and stops dead. And at one point, the gray tells her like your neck. And all I could think about was her standing there, like looking like she's going to throw up with blood pouring down her neck and the guy inside being like, what is happening out there? Um, the woman, the teacher comes out of her and starts to comfort her. And Alex actually interacts with her. Uh, this is the first time that she has talked back and forth with a gray, except for North. Otherwise she has talked at them and they have talked at her, but she hasn't let them know that she can hear them. And the teacher says, we don't go to that house. He buries them in the gardens, hundreds, maybe more. He's been there a very long time. And Alex, when she asks, can I come with you? Alex lets her in. Um, and she sees this like woman's potentially her wife, just perhaps a lover and classrooms and things just sees flashes from this lady's life get some medical supplies and Coke and Doritos. And she goes outside to the bathroom and cleans herself up and then sits on the curb, kind of freaking out. The, the wound in her neck is not a couple of like puncture marks. Like she was hoping it's a, it looks like she's been bitten by an animal. Um, and she does think about whether she's been infected with something. I'm going to assume that's not the case, but who knows? I don't know how things work in this universe, you know? So do you have someone to call? The woman asked. And she says, I have to call Dawes. I just don't want to. So she does. First, she calls Turner. And all she says is something happened to me. I need a ride. She texts her address and he agrees to come. He asks why she won't just call a car. And in her head, she's thinking that she doesn't want to be around any other strangers tonight, which I was like, oh, that's a good point. I can understand that. Just wanting to know who was a known quantity and whatnot. So then she calls Aton, who picks up right away which gives away the fact that he knew what he was sending her into. You set me up. Alex, he chided. I thought you will win. How many did you send before me? How many didn't come back? There was a slight pause. Seven. She brushed tears from her eyes. She wasn't sure when she'd started crying again, but she needed to keep her voice steady. She could do that. The anger was with her, simple, familiar. She didn't want to seem weak. And when he says, she asks if there was a debt, he says, no. She says, fuck you and your associates. You painted a target on my back. Reiter will not bother with you. How the fuck do you know? I have a guests, Alex. You want I should send you some money? And she hung, hangs up, but I was like, you should have just taken some money. Personally, though, him saying he will not bother with you. I don't buy that for a second. Maybe he wouldn't have bothered with any of the other guys that you sent if they didn't make it. If they were ordinary humans who managed to get away, he would say, all right, well, you won that one. But what, what evidence does he have? And he doesn't give her any. I have to assume that he has some because he sounded pretty confident. But to me, Alex is a mystery and a riddle and a puzzle. 
If a vampire is like a demon, which I'm assuming he is, he's going to want to know what the fuck her deal is. He isn't going to be able to resist. So I feel like, yeah, he is going to bother with her. Um, so she hangs up and she's finally like, I'm going to have to kill Aton. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but it's got to be done. And let's see. She had to take her mom out of the equation to make sure that if she screwed up, Mira wouldn't pay and that she couldn't be used as leverage again. To do that, she needed money. A lot of it. So the teacher hangs out until Turner comes and picks her up. And she doesn't want to talk about what she just went through, which a part of me deeply, deeply understood and another part of me found really frustrating and I just wanted so badly for her to open up and, and experience her vulnerability with somebody who is equally as horrified by like the magic in the universe and would I, I react with the proper horror, you know, I don't know. I just felt like the person to talk to when you've just gone through something like this for me it does kind of feel like it's Turner. You don't need answers exactly. Like that can come later. You go to Dawes when you want answers, when you want action. If you want somebody who's just going to share your anger and horror, it's Turner. You know what I'm saying? But she doesn't. And I do get why. Um, and they start talking about uh, the connection between Dean Beekman and Professor Steven, the two murder victims. Stephen blew the whistle on data coming out of one of the labs in the psych department. She had concerns it was massaged by at least one of the fellows and that there'd been shoddy oversight from the professor who published the findings. The dean headed up the committee that disciplined the professor in question. And it turns out that the study was on honesty, which has caused this guy's uh, reputation to really take a hit, but he has tenure, so he has not been fired, of course. Um, and the dude in question, he has solid alibis. There's just no way he did these crimes. Now, of course, we know that probably there is a way he could have, but whether he did or not, that's a whole other question. So, um, Beekman was connected to the societies. He was in Berzelius and she's like, oh, them, they don't really count. And he's like, the, yeah, they do. Apparently they don't have magic. But nevertheless, um, she spent time in the psych ward at Yale, New Haven. She was part of a study led by Marjorie Stephen, and she was in the city the night Dean Beekman was killed. We have her on camera at the train station Monday morning. And she kind of, Alex fixates a little bit on the fact that he found out that he was in the, uh, that Turner found out Michelle was in the psych ward. And when she asks whether that's supposed to be confidential, he's just basically like eye rolls at her and is like, come on, we know what we know. Get out of here. And finally, he, we have this weird moment. Turner asks her, do you believe in God? She says, no. Wow. Not even a beat to think about it. I've thought about it a lot. Do you believe in God? I do, he said with a firm nod. I think I do, but I definitely believe in the devil. And if he gets hold of a soul and doesn't want to let it go, I think you have to try to pry it away from him, even if that soul has the makings of a soul, especially if that soul has the makings of a soldier. Turner, this isn't some kind of holy war. It's not good versus evil. You sure? Well, if it is, are you sure we're the good guys? And he just says... You killed those people in Los Angeles, didn't you? And yo, I didn't expect this to come up this way. I should have known that after all of the association he's had with Alex, that he would have been looking hard into her file. But the left-handed part, does he know about the grays and how that works? Is he aware how that could have been possible? And he pushes her on it and names every victim. 
which she realizes means that he's probably got her whole file memorized and she does not care for that. And she, when he, she's like, doesn't answer him and talks about how life is a bomb. There's, there's no countdown. It just goes off and everything changes. Um, so we go to then chapter 22 she is avoiding seeing Dawes. She goes into the house, which is like seemingly trying to comfort her and uses first aid on her neck, but her neck is actually healing kind of quickly. And she's really wondering about whether or not this means that he pierced her jugular and it's just like closed up before she was able to bleed out. She's just very like, she doesn't know anything about how a single bit of this works. So, yeah, I love this. She hadn't been afraid, truly afraid, in a long time. If she was honest, she'd enjoyed facing off against Darlington's parents, Oddman, the new Preter. When Dawes summoned a herd of fire-breathing horses from hell, she'd been scared, but okay. She liked forgetting about everything except the fight in front of her, but those had been fights she could win. She wasn't strong enough to beat Linus Reader any more than she was clever enough to get out from under Eth Ethan Harrell's thumb. They were the same man. Linus would have happily drunk her dry and planted her in his backyard to feed the roses. Ethan would just keep using her, sending her on jobs, until she didn't come back. And honestly, that was my, my thought as well. I was like, oh, we've, uh, we've put a literal vampire into the story, but we've definitely had, like, metaphorical vampires all over the place. Um... So she gets changed and she goes to the Lethe library and starts asking questions. She uh, first asks about, asks about Linus reader by name. And there's several books focused on that family and where they're from and where they made their money and yada, yada, yada. Um, and one of them is a scrapbook and there are newspaper clippings inside. Uh, there was Linus in the back row, his face solemn, his pale blue eyes nearly white in the old picture. He looked softer somehow, more mobile than he had been sitting in his living room. Had he been human then? Or already turned and having a laugh? And the, the question for me is really like, apparently it's just we're pretending it's being handed down from family to family. Somebody else has to have an inkling, right? About this guy in particular. Um, and there are some, some debates when she's looking through demonology and, uh, she's looking for a vampire, but the book that she winds up with is one that Dawes had been looking for, um, a series of debates on hell between Ellison Nouns and Rudolf Kitcher, a divinity student and devout Christian and an atheist and member of Lethe. And I'm not going to go completely back and forth between these two, but uh, Nouns is basically like, it doesn't matter what hell looks like. We know it's there. We know what it does. And Kitcher is just like, no, we don't. I mean, if there is a place that is like what has been described, it's just another universe. We've seen other realms before. It's just another one of those. It doesn't mean that it's hell. Um, which, I mean... That makes sense. And then, uh, just as we may be nourished by meat or fowl or survive upon a diet of roots and berries, so demons are nourished by our base emotions. Heaven and hell are a compromise, a treaty binding demons to remain in their realm and feed only upon the dead. This was where the crowd turned on Kitcher, and the notes described nouns as red-faced. This is what comes of a vision of a world without God. Nothing, not only a life, but an afterlife devoid of any higher morality. And he thinks that like this insinuating that human beings are just food is like a fucked up suggestion. And Kitcher is like, man, I don't know what to tell you, but all human beings die and go back into the earth. So why shouldn't our souls also have that happen? And they almost get into a fist fight and the notes are not taken after that point. So <laughs> V for vampire. Think on the vampire 
What's next, leprechauns and kelpies? Have you ever wondered why in our stories some seduce and some terrify? Why some are beautiful and others grotesque? These disparate stories are proof that demons remain in our world, some who feed on misery or terror, others who feed on desire, all of whom take the forms most likely to elicit those emotions. And she's thinking that maybe that's why Linus has become a drug dealer, that perhaps he feeds on like desperation and is remembering what she used to be like. And it's like, there would be plenty of that. Um, and then she stops and thinks about the, it says, why had the library provided her with information on a vampire when she had specifically asked for books mentioning Linus Reader? She kept the Albemarle book open and returned to the round table where she'd left Kitcher's demonology. Reader hadn't been listed in the index. She flipped to the back of the book. Minutes taken by Philip Walter Merriman, Oculus 1933, in attendance, and Lionel Reader was a skull and bones. And she's not sure if he was still mortal then, or maybe he was already a demon, but evidently nobody had known. And 1933, a year after Sterling had been built. Did that, did that mean there really had been a first pilgrimage to hell? Was that the subtext here? Who had known about the gauntlet? And was this less a heated argument about philosophic hypotheticals than a very real debate about the possibility of traveling to the underworld. And uh, she's thinking about like, well, maybe if there are vampires, like for real, is it possible that one of them fed on Professor Stephen and somehow like made her look old? Is that what could be happening here? Um, and she's just thinking about how, if this guy had been turned, was a vampire already in this moment, everybody was sitting with him with no clue. And it just really hammers home how nobody really knows what they're doing. Everybody who is involved in this magic is just going off of what they are reading in books and what has been kept on record. They're all amateurs. And I always appreciate that reminder because the amount of knowledge they have it can feel like they've got it figured out. And I'll forget that like, no, but they fucked up a few times, you know, they weren't aware of everything that Alex could do. And the fact that like Darlington was trying to communicate with her using that body, she picked up on the fact that there was something going on there while they were dismissing it as just kind of like the random erratic movements of this corpse. That's like kind of coming down basically, you know, um, and let's see, crosses and holy water. Garlic was only effective as a repellent toward a particular type of succubus. Wards worked in the armory. She located a white, la a wide lacy collar made of tiny salt pearls that she could tuck neatly under her shirt. She lay down in the Dante bedroom beneath the velvet blue canopy and dreamed she was playing croquet on Linus Reader's lawn. She was barefoot and the grass was wet. She could see blood seeping up between her toes. And he's Darlington in the white suit and he calls her honey lamb and says, have you come to be devoured? Uh, and when she talks to him and says there are two of him, there have to be the boy and the monster. I am the hermit in the cave. I saw everything in your grandfather's memory and you trying to survive this place. And they talk a little bit about his parents and whether she should have let them in. And he says, never. And mentions them turning the power out. And I don't know how not to love them. And she's had the same feeling about her mother. Um, Galaxy Stern, I have been crying out to you from the start. And that is the last thing that she remember that she dreams before she wakes up. So this for me is like, you know, his desperation for magic. I feel like that's kind of what he means. She's like somehow a real manifestation 
of true magic, even though she doesn't really seem to see herself that way. And I think that maybe his search, he found it in her and that's what he means. But uh, we have some more. I'm not going to get into because, you know, there's always quotes before each chapter and stuff. Um, I'm not going to get into that next one, but we'll go to 23 where Alex is meeting with Anselm to ask about money. Um, she had thought he would refer her to the Preter, but he instead meets her himself at a place called Shell and Bones, an oyster bar, which is a very fun name. And we get right before she goes and meets him, the conversation between her and Dawes. Um, this is so, this is rough, but it needed to happen because it's obviously been something Dawes is sitting on. Um, she doesn't want to tell Dawes what happened to her again, Alex, you've got to fucking talk to people a little bit more. You know, I, I understand and respect your experiences, but you have got to talk to people. Like, I, I get it that she doesn't want to reveal why she went and what's going on with Aton, but figure it out. Find a way. Um, You lost him, Dawes seethed, and now this. I didn't lose Darlington. He isn't a shiny penny I dropped somewhere. Elliot Sandow sent a hell beast to eat him. So go to the cemetery and bitch at his tombstone if you want to. You should have what? I should have what? Known the right spell to speak, the right incantation. I should have grabbed him so we could go to hell together. Yes. Yes. You're his Dante. Is that what you'd have done? Dawes didn't answer, and Alex knew she should let it lie, but she was too tired and bruised to be kind. And honestly, disagree. She should not let it lie. Dawes is being hateful here, and she needs to be checked. I'll tell you what you would have done, Dawes. You would have pissed yourself. You would have frozen, just like I did, and Darlington would be just as gone. And... Dawes takes a second and then finally starts yelling, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And finally, she's like, look, I get it, but I need a little grace right now. We're going to get it back. I'm sorry I was rude. <laughs> but honestly, I'm glad they finally had this out because it has been very clear, despite intellectually i think knowing better dawes has been blaming alex this whole time like you know it, it's just very very obvious so and i'm not like super angry at her for that exactly it's just more if you let that simmer for too long it starts to just stew and and get ugly so good i'm glad this has been done um and Let's see. Then we have the conversation. When she asks him for the money, she asks for $20,000. And I was really not expecting this amount of money. She also says as a gift, I won't be able to pay an amount like that back, which I really admire that she's admitting that. But wow, what an ask. And I'm not entirely sure she wants enough to break her lease and move her mother out where she's at. And I feel like 20 grand seems like more than she'll need. But to be perfectly honest, when I think about like rent prices and how you're expected to pay like first and last and whatnot, maybe not. Um, and he is sort of caught off guard by this. Like there's, there's a whole conversation that happens before they get to the money uh, where he she she asks him about Dean Beekman um, and he asks whether she's checking alibis and she's just like, oh, just old habits after everything that happened last year. Um, and he says something about how Lethe asks a lot of us and it's like, uh, 
something that you shouldn't take that seriously. He, the, the way he says it, she takes it as a sort of warning. Um, I'm trying to find the spot where, it, where he says it here. Let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, this is a place that will never repay your loyalty. Lethe was an extracurricular. It's silly to think of it as anything else. Dangerous even. So, yeah, I'm curious whether, like, silly, that's one thing. Saying it's dangerous, though, I feel like that's true. Silly feels dismissive in a way that is, has a bit of contempt to it. And I'm sure he means it that way. But uh, I feel like it's less about that and maybe more about the fact that he hasn't had some of the experiences that she has had. So he gives less credence to some of the, like when he says dangerous, even it sounds more like dangerous in a way that he maybe hasn't experienced, but is aware there is potential for. If, if that makes sense, like he doesn't really, and he is aware that he is not, he hasn't, ever plumbed the full depths of what is going on with the societies and what is out there, especially considering what Alex can do and the way that her abilities have sort of expanded as well. Um, but yeah, there's this conversation that she has with him and he says, let's see, uh, Let's see. It's from the sermon John Davenport gave in support of the three judges. You've never been to Judge's Cave? Okay. So the year is 1649 and Cromwell orders the execution of Charles I. 59 judges sign the death warrant. Just a decade later, the monarchy is restored and his son, Charles II, isn't pleased or, and uh, he has to be ruthless. So he sentences all of the judges to death. Some of them are, exec are executed, some flee to the colonies. There are British soldiers everywhere. No one is particularly excited about harboring fugitives and bringing down Junior's wrath, even for the good citizens of New Haven. It's always been a contrary town. The good Reverend John Davenport sets up, steps up to the pulpit and preaches, Hide the outcasts, be rain not him that wandereth and hide the outcasts they do when the british come snooping around the townspeople keep their secrets and the judges hide out near west rock their names were whaley goff and dixwell and i'm going to assume that this is a true story of oh, those names are indeed names of very big thoroughfares in new haven all of them ringing bells for me um but yeah it's a really weird story she says what happened to them did they get caught and he says no two of them ended up somewhere in massachusetts dixwell changed his name and lived out his days in new haven his ashes are interred beneath the new haven green british troops used to travel here just to piss on his gravestone 100 years after he died that's how big a deal these guys were and that is pretty wild. I mean, look, I don't want people pissing on my grave, but the idea that they like literally traveled all the way to do it, that's almost a compliment. I mean, you've really got people's attention if they're going to change their travel plans in order to make a special stop. Uh, no. You made an impression. That's all I'm saying. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this is the moment where she asks about the money and it's an interesting moment when he mentions her and she says something kind of, she's just not a realist and she's not good with money. Does she embarrass you? The question startled her and Alex wasn't ready for the rush of emotion that came with it. And she is just like really not sure what to say. And she starts feeling teary and has to sort of calm herself down and she just says, I need to find a way to help her. And he thinks she means like, find me work. And she's like, no, no, no. I need something that's a lot more immediate and a lot bigger than that. And finally, 
Um, you read my file. You know what I can do. I can see the dead. I can even speak to them. You want information? You want access to the veil? I can get it for you. And I don't need some stupid ritual at Book and Snake to do it. You can hear them? That's incredibly risky. But the possibilities... He might want to be done with Lethe and all of its strange magic. But he also knew how much the Ninth House valued that kind of access. How much power it might yield. Sandow had once called Lethe the beggars at the table. Authorities without authority. Alex's gift could change that. And power was a language they all understood. And finally, he says, I need you to be honest with me. Are you still trying to get back Darlington? And she says no, and manages to be pretty convincing with the fact that she isn't going to like stick her neck out again for some kid who talked down to her a few times. Um, and, you know, like... I think that there's a part of him that knows that she's full of shit or suspects it, but he can't quite resist the suggestion of what she's dangling in front of him. Um, and finally he stands up and he says, keep your nose clean and make sure things stay quiet. I'll get you that money. And when he had like first sat down and he was all charming she felt like he was reminding her a lot of darlington but this moment is when he looks like as she puts it a grifter uh he was one more thief rummaging through artifacts in a country not his own he was the lethe alex understood not the lethe darlington had loved so then chapter 24 the night before halloween they met in the dining room at Il Bastone. And I love this. Everybody is a little bit dressed up and Alex isn't. And she's just kind of like, oh man, should I fucking have changed here? And I love this line. Why raise children on the promise of magic? Why create a want in them that can never be satisfied for revelation, for transformation, and then set them adrift in a bleak, pragmatic world? In Darlington, she'd seen what grief over that loss could do to someone, but maybe the same mourning lived inside her, too. The terrible knowledge there would be no secret destiny, no kindly mentor to see some hidden talent inside her, no deadly nemesis to best. And yeah, I do really like that, that we've got, you know, the subversion of her abilities and her being like the chosen one in the ordinary sense it's not to say that there isn't something special about her but at the end of the last book we met somebody who could do what she could do and do even more actually um and she is like thinking about how she had gone to a manuscript party where this woman is uh tied to a chair and a bird is like <laughs> in a bridle is is hung over her mouth to shit down her throat to bring back her legendary voice which is truly oh my god but yeah her her assertion here is basically like everybody thinks that magic is this beautiful thing but it's actually super gross and disgusting and dangerous and uh we don't really know a whole lot about it. We know these little things that we make use of. And again, we're amateurs. Um, so I, I still really do enjoy trip, even though he is such a dolt. He's so happy with Alex's cooking. And I mean, Alex is not Alex's cooking. Dawes is cooking. Uh, and Dawes is an amazing cook and she doesn't know how to like, accept this compliment from this guy without also being disapproving of him because he obviously exemplifies a lot of the things that she explicitly hates about the boys who go to this school. Um, there's a moment later on where Mercy says something to him with a kind of edge to her voice and Alex is wondering about it. But all I could think was that Mercy would see him as somebody who had been friends with Blake and potentially another predator 
you know, and like we know him, I think at this point, just well enough to believe that he wasn't a predator himself and he knew that Blake Keeley was kind of a bad dude. But that is not to say that he would necessarily have stood up to Blake. Like it's possible that he knew and just didn't do anything. And Mercy, I'm sure, would have some feelings about that. You know, I'm surprised that Alex doesn't, but I think Alex sort of just takes it more for granted that all dudes are trash that are complicit in everything. And so she makes it less personal on a one-to-one -one basis, um, which I'm not saying that's the right way to handle it, but I can understand that it feels just like the more expedient way to handle it. Um, so they talk for a little while. She asks uh, Turner if Professor Lambton has kids and he says a son and yes he has an alibi you may want to check that alibi again the quotes we've been chasing all lead back to the execution of charles the first but it was his son who went looking for revenge um and i'm wondering like if there's anything to that i'm i don't know i just i don't feel like i have a good enough grip on this case so it's time to start um when they're talking, like they're, they're getting things set up. Mercy asks, what are we going to tell Lauren? And they wind up telling Lauren because they have to leave the party early that they're going to go and help with like something at Mercy's parents church with Halloween. She, she has said to herself something so dull, Lauren wouldn't want to come. And that's the only thing that they could come up with, <laughs> which I was like, that's actually very solid. That seems like it probably worked like a charm. Um, Dawes says, fast for at least six hours before. Do not consume any meat or dairy. You're going to want empty bowels. Our sentinel will be stationed in the courtyard. The four pilgrims will walk the gauntlet starting at one o'clock exactly. And this is such a weird... So, first of all, we have Mercy, who has already started to memorize the death words because she's a great student. And when Dawes says that she has something in mind for protection against a demon, Mercy says salt armor and Dawes is so pleased. Alex was embarrassed to feel a pang of jealousy at that proud look. Another unpleasant reminder that she was the interloper here. And honestly, I really felt for her <laughs> that one. I mean, you know, I appreciate that she is embarrassed by it because, yeah, that's the thing about emotions is that they'll like sometimes come up out of nowhere and you're sort of surprised at them. And then you have a reaction to yourself. And sometimes it is embarrassment. I have had this before myself, you know, feelings of being threatened or being pissed and then being like, God, what is my problem? You know? But it's based in something real. Alex just has never felt like she belongs here. And here's Mercy sliding into this role beautifully. Um, so it, they need a metronome to keep this like rhythm uninterrupted until the ritual is complete. Uh, and we begin outside and mark with our blood. <laughs> Turner says this is some satanic shit and I'm just like dude you have just seen so little and you're already like squeamish about it he would just not be able to handle so we have the scholar the priest the prince and the soldier and I was really taken off guard instead of the the way that uh Dawes puts it is that given Turner's religious leanings, he can take the office of priest. Now, Tripp, of course, is the prince. Dawes, of course, is the scholar. But you guys know, I had already said I felt like Alex definitely was the priest. Like, no, religion doesn't factor into it. She can literally see the dead, though. Like, that just feels like she is a link in a way that Turner isn't. And Turner is a fucking cop. Like, how is that not a soldier? That's, that's, it just, I didn't think that this made sense. And I'm wondering if they keep it this way 
uh, if anybody else listening to this also had the same reaction as me, like it just, you know, soldiers and, and cops have a lot more in common. I don't, I think of a soldier as somebody who's, who's, and, and maybe this is the problem that I'm like seeing it in a different way, but I'm a soldier as being somebody who like fights for an establishment, which is absolutely not Alex's MO in any way. She is fighting on behalf of what she thinks is right. And the establishment can stay or leave and she won't care. That's not what this is about at all. That's exactly what it's about for Turner, though. And I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But I just really was so certain. So when it went this way, I was taken completely aback. Um, and let's see. We're sure that the courtyard is the spot. And Dawes is pointing out that there are like compass points there and the inscriptions, um, the tree of knowledge. I love this. There's also this. Dawes held up a photo of a stone grid of numbers. Sudoku? Asked Trip. Dawes looked at him as if she wasn't sure whether to put him to bed with a hot water bottle or hit him with a shovel. I really sympathize with that. There are just some people like that who... They just, they, they're barely keeping up. And while y you find yourself infuriated, there's no real malice in them at all, you know? So you, you don't like, but your instinct is to throttle them and you have to be like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, it's the magic square from Altbrek Doros Melancholia. Every direction you add the numbers, the sum is always the same. I think it's a gesture toward containment, a puzzle for the demon to get caught in. Um, and there is a fountain in the middle. It was added after the built, the library was built because something was seeping up through the stones. Silence settled over the room. I'm like, you think? <laughs> oh boy. So they descend and It's a poison that they have to take. It needs a steady hand. And then we die. Trip gave a nervous laugh. Metaphorically, right? Slowly, Dawes shook her head. From what I can tell, we'll be buried alive. Shit, said Turner. The verb is unclear, Dawes offered. It might be buried or submerged. <laughs> So we die. Then what? At some point, we should encounter Darlington, the part of him still stuck in hell. We secure his soul in a vessel. Then we return to this plane and take it back to Black Elm. And that's when we'll be at our most vulnerable. If we don't close off the gauntlet, something can follow us. What we're doing is considered theft. We have no reason to think hell will give up a soul easily. And Trip calls it a hell heist. I just honestly, Trip, you're delightful. What a what a great character to add into this weird mix. You need some levity. <laughs> honestly, at this point, I keep picturing the guy who played Jason Mendoza in The Good Place as Trip, even though I know he's definitely a white dude. But uh, that is who I've got in my head. <laughs> um. We do need to move fast and stay on our guard until the two parts of Darlington's soul are brought together will be targets. And she talks about the vessel they need to carry it. And Alex doesn't explain to her what her idea is, but she's thinking about that box that Darlington used to like mix up the, uh, the weird version of that potion. And, how he had thought it had magical properties to it. So I think that's probably a, a really good choice. I really wonder about like, does he really think that or so last one in this grouping is chapter 25 and Alex and Mercy are really going to town, decorating the place, trying to sort of make up for the fact that they're going to be leaving the party early. Um, 
Alex had gone to Black Elm, picked up the mail, put out fresh food and water for Cosmo, and walked the length of the first floor to the office. She knew Darlington had worked in here sometimes. But the office felt different than the rest of the house because it had belonged to the old man. And she finds the box. That thing upstairs isn't Danny. The old man was standing next to, da to Alex. She could feel him inching closer, hoping to climb inside her, eager to be in a body again. And I love the way she words this. She wasn't about to become a carnival ride for some bitter old bastard who had cared more about his legacy than the little boy he'd trapped in this castle. And honestly, I like often kind of am on his side, but the way that she words that I was like, no, yeah, she, he like handed down a curse kind of with the way he handled things with Daniel and yeah, there's something despicable in that, even if he didn't quite know what he was doing. Um, and she uses death words to send him away and she goes up to see Darlington and he is standing to the cir like on the edge of the circle and looking at her. We're coming to get you. You need to be ready. I can't hold on much longer. You have to. If it doesn't work, we'll come back to strengthen the protections. You can certainly try. Tonight, she repeated. Why wait? It isn't easy to figure out a gauntlet and assemble a search party of killers willing to go to hell. And Dawes says our chances are better on a night of portent. As you like, wheel walker, you choose the steps in this dance. And when she says, was it you in the dream? Was it real? His smile was the same as it had been in the dream when he said, this isn't the time for philosophy, Stern. And all of a sudden, he's like back to himself for a minute and asks why she's doing this. And she's not really sure exactly how to answer him. And uh, she's thinking back at him talking about like the elixir and, you know, the way that she had reacted to him, like the muscles as he's working. And she says, you didn't turn away. Even when you didn't like what you saw in me, you kept looking because he had said, it's our duty to fight. But more than that, it's our duty to see what others won't and never avert our eyes. And he says to her, maybe I know a fellow monster when I see one. It felt like a cold hand shoving her away, like a warning. She wasn't stupid enough to ignore it. And honestly, I didn't take it that way. If, she, if that's what it feels like, I respect that. But I didn't really take it that way in the moment. I almost felt like that was him trying to connect. But I don't know the way that I don't, I, I, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can say something. Um, and the chapter ends with maybe they were monsters who liked the feeling of another monster looking back at them, but enough people had abandoned them both. She wasn't going to be the next. And that is how chapter 25 wraps up. So yeah, God, I really don't know. I I'm, I'm like, dying to continue reading this book and I'm also worried because I know the next one isn't out yet and I I'm I'm going to have I'm going to be caught up you guys and have to wait in in that's get like that's hoping that the books get commissioned when the next ones come out which there's no guarantee of that it's uh this is torment but I really really enjoy it and I don't know what to do with the fact that there's going to be a fucking like vampire in the mix. Like, is he going to interfere with the gauntlet? What is he going to, what is he for plot wise? Genuinely don't know. <sighs> anyway. All right. I'm going to have to wrap this up. Um, thank you very much to Joanna for commissioning this. Really, really appreciate it. Hope everybody listening is enjoying the coverage. And until next time, toodaloo motherfuckers.
is an unspoiled network podcast.